I want to talk about wealth creation and wealth building. Sure. What do you think are the three most important steps to building wealth Indivi- um, for an individual? Uh, ownership. Mm. Like literally equity ownership. Yeah. Like you look at the most wealthy people in the world and if you want to be wealthy, you need to be an owner. They have so, equity in something. They have yeah, equity yeah. in something. You yeah. have equity in your small business. You, you know, you're like my sister. You... You have equity in your practice and you sell your patient files, yeah. you know, to a bigger partnership or you're like me and you have equity in a big company or small company, whether you started it or not. You know, equity ownership is the key to wealth creation. That's uh-huh. why people own their homes. Yeah. The biggest source of wealth for people, home ownership, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be an owner. Okay. That's so, yeah, uh, for sure, uh, that's, um, that's, a, that's a big one. Number two, you know this. Everybody knows it, but we need to do it. Saving. Uh-huh. Saving just like saving early and compounding returns. Yeah. Um, I think is the second. A lot of people don't do that. Oh, I started doing that years do. ago. Most people don't do it. Even when I didn't have that much money, I was like, ah, eh, even five hundred bucks a year, a thousand bucks. You know, when I was broke, I know, right? This is something. It's I remember. I, I remember. I started at like twenty-seven, maybe starting to like my IRA and then just yes. other investments. And I was like, but I don't have that much to invest to save in. Yeah, I wasn't making that much, but. Now, 11 years later, I'm like, oh, look what I've accumulated. Well, you more know, importantly, yeah. saving allows you to do what? Become an owner. Like, right, right. You, know, you can so buy these something are, with it. You got it. These are inherently yeah. related, right? Mm-hmm. So if you say, like, if you don't save, guess what? The day the equity ownership comes up to buy a piece of a, a home, or these a days land, a piece whatever, of a yeah. home, or a land, or, whatever. or a stock market, exactly. you know, equity in the stock market, art, anything. whatever you want to, yeah. If you don't have savings, how do you become an owner? It's uh, impossible. So these two things are inherently related, right? Uh-huh. So even if it's fractional ownership, which we all have opportunities for yes. now. So I think um, yeah. in order to become an owner, you need to accumulate savings. Okay. So I think that's the, um, I think that is, I, those are my two. I don't have a third. third those are yeah. it. Those are the two. What about the mindset around wealth and, and creating more financial abundance? Yeah. How do we shift the narrative from thinking, you know, money's bad or I don't understand yes. money or I'm not uh, educated on it so that I'm not going to receive it. How, yeah. do we, how do we change the mindset of the conversations we have yeah. around money? Sure. Because I feel like a lot of people don't talk about it enough. Yeah, I know. People, I mean, and, and I don't know, there's no shame in wealth creation, right? Mm. I mean, but I think there are two things. First of all, financial literacy is so key. You know yes. this. I yes. mean, if you don't have financial literacy, it's hard, yeah. it's hard right? So, um, so I was lucky that my, uh, you know, I give my dad so much credit. My dad, like, owned equities. Like, he literally owned stocks. He would call his broker and buy them every day. So I saw stock ownership as a thing, right? Uh-huh. And then I ended up becoming a financial analyst. So, of course, I got financially literate. But my point is, if you're not literate, getting literate about is how you understand savings and ownership, what have you. So I think that literacy is sort of one way and not to be afraid of these conversations. What are, what are two books you would recommend to someone on so, becoming more financially literate? Uh, so to be honest, I've never read a book in my life because I did it all on the job. Yeah, yeah. So I think I'm a poor person to answer that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just down. Like, yeah, yeah. if you said, like, yeah, have you yeah. read a book on financial literacy? I'd no. be like, uh, you had mentors. I had mentors, yeah. and like, my first job was as a financial analyst. So, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I went to undergraduate business school, you know, so I did my dad's taxes. Like, understand, I, I think did you were his 12 taxes. And you did that, right? I started teaching us to do his ledgers, like, to literally write, like, numbers in a ledger when we were seven or eight. Like, yeah, wow. doing his taxes was a family affair. That's crazy. Like, no joke. So, so I, when I say I was grown financially literate, that's actually true. Mm-hmm. So, I don't think I'm a good person to recommend a book. But, um, you could probably have a client of yours who would give people yeah. the best recommendations. So I think literacy is one. Number two, I think if we are a female in a, in, in a relationship, we tend to think um, that there's some shame in asking the other, you know, like your husband or, you know, whatever. Whoever is the wealth store, like you have to, to your point, you have to ask. Ask what questions? Well, you have to ask, like, where are our bank accounts? What do we have? Like, if you just, it's not just a question of being literate. It's a question of being, like, informed and not just trusting your financial decisions to other people, yes. right? So, mm. like, some people, like, if they're not literate, they won't ask. I'd say the converse is true. Like, you can be literate and ask at the same time. So if somebody is managing your money, you better freaking know where it is. And part of getting literate is being comfortable with asking questions, like, and if you don't, so so I think there's literacy and there's information, and they're very highly correlated. So I know people who their husbands or you know manage all their money. I know people who give money to their broker and they don't know what their broker is investing in. I'm like, okay, so one is literacy, but one is like sheer information. 
So I see a lot of people who are like, this is an uncomfortable topic. So I'm just going to also outsource not just literacy. I'm just going to outsource information. Mm. Like somebody else has information on my financial well-being. That's a little crazy to me. But I yes. see a lot of people who just don't want to have the conversation. More often women than men. This is why like platforms like Elvest and others that like mm -hmm. are driving to, you know, driving uh, women to manage their own wealth, I think is so, is, is disproportionately important. So I think that, I think that's, I think, I think how that's can, very key. How can women change the mindset around, you know, earning, saving, investing, and becoming more, you know, well, having more ownership is, of their money mind? Well, first of all, I think many women are. Okay. Um, but I just think that platforms that do it, I think anything that gives you education without it mean, being intimidating mm -hmm. is like very critical. So I think that like, I think women are doing it more and more. But I think that platforms that can accelerate your knowledge or your management of your own money is key. The third thing you can do, as we talked about, take a little risk. Like if you're too afraid to manage all your money, take 10% of it and say, I'm going to yeah. go, I'm going to manage this directly. Right. And then the third thing I say to people is, um, if you want to start creating wealth, invest in what you know. Okay, mm. so people think that... Don't invest in crypto if you don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not just like literate about like how financial systems work. It's like literally invest in what you know. Yeah. So I've become an e-commerce investor over the last 10 years and a pretty good one. But that's because I was an e-commerce CEO. Right. And you so understand while the, I, the I understand the yeah. business. And so I was practicing every day. I thought like, God, like I know enough about these numbers to know where our numbers look good or bad. But that gives me pattern recognition in becoming an angel investor. So right. as opposed to like... Yes, I had diversification of wealth across different sectors or diversification of angel investments across different sectors of e-commerce, but literally I doubled down on e-commerce because I understood that business. Right. When I was an analyst, I was at Merrill Lynch and early in my career and I worked on the financial services industry, the savings and loan industry, which is the most, you know, uh, I learned about savings and loans, balance sheets and income statements and the first stocks I ever bought were in the savings and loan industry because I was like, I understand what good mm -hmm, looks like. Mm -hmm. So I think if you want to create wealth, you you know, you need to understand what you're investing in. Yeah. Let's say you're going to buy real estate. Okay, well, you need to understand the neighborhood. You need to understand the comps. You can't just fall in love with the house and right. say like, you know, is this a good investment? It looks investment? good. I'm just going to buy it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I mean this like one and done, somebody shows you something, you know. Right. So I think there's generally literate asking about your own money and understanding like where it is, who's managing it, like what's there. If you're shy about that, like I think that's, and then I think number three, um, very specifically literate when you want to invest in yeah, something. Yeah, If someone feels like a failure, like they have these failure conversations with themselves, they feel like they have a lot of negative thoughts, how can we overcome these negative thoughts and help us get out of a rut if we mm -hmm. kind of feel like we're always stuck in that failure mindset? Yeah, look, I, um, I think that when people are looking at failure, one of the reasons I think failure is so daunting for people um, is because they think of and they think that a choice is binary. So I think there are two things that you need to do if you want to get out of failure mindset. First of all, you have to get out of this idea that you have one shot at glory. Mm. Okay, so we fear failure because we think whatever decision we make is what Jeff Bezos calls a one-way door. I go through this door, there's no coming back. It's going to define me forever. It's going to define me forever, like, right? When Jeff Bezos in the shareholder letter uh, to Amazon shareholders said, very clearly said, most of the decisions we make at Amazon are two-way doors. You go through, it doesn't look out, you come back, mm. right? So I think that most people have the perception that failure is um, the result of a binary choice. You know, you make one choice, it fails or succeeds. Now, if you believe like I believe, that actually between you and a reward is probably not one decision, but 30 40, 100, does the first, should you really overweight the importance of the first mm, decision? Mm. I would say you should overweight your ability to keep choosing. If you can keep choosing, you will find a path. It may not be, you may not end up where you started, but you know, where you wanted when you started, but there will be a path. But that, like you have to dismiss this myth that failure is a bi bimodal, binary, one-way door. It isn't. It's just the first choice in a series of choices you will inevitably have to make. Yeah. So first of all, stop thinking about failure as like a one choice uh, circumstance. It's just not. Then number two, and I will say this, supposing the decision you're contemplating is in fact bigger, and it is a one-way door. I make it up. You mortgage your house. Right. You're starting a company. Like, you know, you can't take back the mortgage. You quit your day job. You have, go to zero salary, and you mortgage your house. Okay, we could agree that's a big risk. In that mode, I always say to people like, okay, well, if it's a big risk, then as opposed to planning for all the upside that's going to happen on the other side, plan for the failure mode. Plan for the failure mode 
in order to get yourself to act. And people are like, what do you mean? I'm like, okay. If something's really, you know, a big and scary risk, I want you to tell me the five choices you'd make after the choice. Tell me. Like, what are they? Before the interview continues, if you feel like you're not living your most authentic life, not leaning into your purpose, and not living the life that your future self would be extremely proud of, I've written a new book called The Greatness Mindset, and I think you're gonna love this. Through powerful stories, science-backed strategies, and step-by-step -step guidance, The Greatness Mindset will help you overcome all the different challenges in your life to design the life of your dreams and then turn it into your reality. Make sure to click the link below in the description to get your copy today. Okay, let's get back to this video. What are the two? What are the for three? The what are the four? If it fails, what if it will fails, do? play yeah. through the failure. Tell me the five choices, and then I bet that you will find two, three, four recovery paths. But actively think about that now. Park all of your imagining of the upside. Okay, that's great to get what I call your mm -hmm, FOMO going. Mm -hmm. You'll get really excited. Fear of missing out is like you know you want to act. You visualize the positive, but when you're trying to overcome failure, I'm like visualize a failure work it through, yes. understand all your contingencies, mm -hmm. and then you're pro probably far more likely to get into action. Because what you've done is reduce your feel of your failure. Yes. Because you can actually, you're actively imagining the choices after the choice when it fails. It's interesting you say that because I was interviewing a UFC fighter, uh, George St. Pierre. Yeah. And it was one of the greatest of all time. And he was talking, I think it was him or another UFC fighter that I heard, I can't remember which one it was, but I'm talking about how they train to be in the most uncomfortable situations. Yes. Like, I'm on my back, my arm is behind my back, I've got a hand here, and a guy's just punching me in the face. How do I get out of this? Yes, that's exactly How right, do I right. get out of it? How do I stay calm? How do I not, like, pass out? How do I, you know, if I'm in the worst position possible, like, every bad position I train for, yes. and I train to get out of it. Yeah. So that exactly. when it does happen, yes. I'm like, this sucks and it's uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but I know I can get out of it. Yeah. And if I can just get back on my feet and stand up again, then I can take the yeah, next step. Yeah, right, exactly. And then, and and I think for people who are like, I fail. Let's say you pick a new job and you left your old job and you cut your ties mm -hmm. and it fails. I'm like, okay, what that? What then? So play yeah. through. Okay. You lose your relationship. You lose your kid. Everything you lose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then you're like, okay, well, then what would you do? Yeah. Because I think that on small failures, it's enough to know that if you act once. You still have ten more choices yes. on something that is like truly a one-way door. There, you, there are few, very few decisions, decisions that truly you can't come back from. And those things, you're like, okay, then what are my contingencies? Right. What do I do? So I believe that like this risk-taking equation guides all of all of us, which is fear of fear of missing out is warned with fear of failure. Which everyone is like, you know, fear of missing out is greater than fear of failure. Mm -hmm. You'll take action if fear of failure is greater than fear of missing out. You won't. But most people only want to work one side of that equation, which is think about the positive. Right. And I'm like. No, you got to think about both. Yeah, it's really, it's, yeah. One of my coaches, uh, Chris Lee, years ago, probably like seven years ago, I had been training for years already to overcome the fear of public speaking. And I, and oh, I'd been, really? And I'd been speaking for, I don't know, at this point, 10 years yes. professionally. And I'd made good money on stages yes, and, and, and spoken in front of 20,000 people. And I remember saying to him, I was like, gosh, I don't know why, but I still feel like kind of scared and nervous. Yes. Like the day before I yeah. go on. <laughs> and... I don't know why. And I remember calling him like hours before and I go, I don't know why I'm still nervous mm -hmm. and a little afraid. Mm -hmm. And he said, because one of the things is you're afraid of how you're going to look. Mm -hmm. You're afraid of like being embarrassed or not like saying the right thing or messing up. You're still afraid of that mm -hmm. as opposed to being of service to the audience and knowing you're going to mess. Not, it's right. not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And he put me through an exercise like, what, well, like a what if or what happens next exercise. Just go, okay, what if you what if you forget your words? What if you forget yeah. that story? Then what? Then what? Then, then what? what? And you just go, then, then what? what? I call that go, the choice after the choice. Then what? Well, then, then what? I'll be then like what? embarrassed. Well, then what? Well, then uh, what's the worst could happen? Uh, I don't know. Then I just walk off stage and you know, I yeah. forget the whole thing. And then what? And then what? And he's like, well, everyone laughs at me. Okay, and then what? And then I don't want to come out for a week because I'm yeah. so embarrassed. And then what? And it's like eventually you, you're like, okay, I'm down here and I... <laughs> I'll pick myself back up and I'll be okay yeah. and I'll, you know, I'll start again. Yeah, so. I think that that's sort of the point. Like the then what, then what, then what. We sort of have trained ourselves to think that it has to be, you know, that it, like I said, it's bimodal. I'm like, yeah. it's not bimodal. It's like what will happen is you'll discover the five choice after choice. So think those through now. Yes. Because in there is comfort. <sighs> it's so good. It's so good. What is the thing that you're most proud of most people don't know about you? What I'm most proud of career-wise, and then I think what, what, yes. what I'm most proud of people, what I'm most proud of career-wise is I have had a career of working with exceptionally talented people where I feel like 
I got to be part of accelerating their journey. That mm. is what I'm most proud of. Like, I'll look back That's on cool. my life and say, regardless of the companies or what, I like, I just look, I always say to people, do you know how amazing it is to work with tribes of great people who are by and large great human beings That's as nice. well? And then be like, oh yeah, I will look at my journey and be like, I got to intersect with these amazing people and maybe for a few of them, or hopefully mm. some a meaningful number of them, I was an accelerant. So that's what I'm most proud of, kind of business-wise. What am I most proud of that people wouldn't know about me? Um, maybe that I think I wake up every day both fully empowered and also pretty clear that uh, I'm like pretty far from the center of the universe. Like mm. I'm, I'm proud of the fact <laughs> that I think that most people would think that I wake up thinking I sort of must rule the roost. And most days I'm like, no, I wake up pretty empowered, but I... I'm really grounded and clear that, you know, life is a blessing. Mm. I'm here for a reason. Mm -hmm. I'm living my impact. Um, the world is a much, much bigger place than just me. Mm -hmm. um, yet I feel very stable with it. Like yeah. I, 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 like I, I, I don't feel like many things. I don't, nothing's going to shake me. Yeah, that's yeah cool. because I have a sense for why I'm here and what I'm meant to do without thinking that it's all about me. Right. So I, I'm proud of that. That's I'm cool. I'm proud of that. Like, yeah. That's great. I'm like, I'm good with it. That's great. Uh, the book is about risks, and you say most things won't shake you, mm -hmm. but when people take big risks, sometimes it shakes them a lot. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest myths around risk taking um, that we tell ourselves? Yeah. And by the way, of course, if you read the book, you'll know that many risks I took shook me, which yeah. is the whole reason <laughs> for writing the book, because I'm like, okay, don't let it shake you. This is what happened to me. So I can't say I've never been shaken yeah, by risk. Yeah. Um, but I think I, I keep coming back to that singular point. Like, I know it sounds so simple, but it is the point of the entire freaking book. The book is about how, but the point of the book is about, you know, let go of this myth of the single choice. Mm. Stop believing that outcomes are binary that risk and reward is a singer, singular linear, linear game. Like, hey, I take a big risk, I get a big reward, you know, or I have an epic fail. Like, it's just not like that. Yeah, it's either I win big or I lose it all. Exactly. That is this bimodal issue. I think that is the biggest myth, myth around risk taking. And it's the whole reason I wrote the book. I'm like, you have to keep choosing. Stop overweighting the first choice. Mm. You know, if you are willing to keep choosing, there are, you know, a, a thousand. Um, a thousand choices between you and success. And I cannot promise you that the success you'll get at the end is the one you originally thought. It may or may not be. Mm. But I can tell you that if you keep aiming for impact in every single choice, cumulatively, you will have an outsized career and you mm. will have an outsized life. Yeah. Cumulatively. Yeah. But if you want to measure yourself on every single choice, I can tell you the you know, the people I know who succeed greatly are pretty freaking imperfect. They're master risk takers, mm. as measured by small and big acts of possibility, right? As opposed to this one big act of possibility for which they're famous. Like, mm, no, they roll by becoming a master at the process of risk taking mm -hmm. and constantly choosing. They're just, right? They're very skilled at continuing to choose. Yeah. I'm curious, do you believe that it's harder to go from zero to 10 million? Mm -hmm. Like in startup, like here's yeah. my idea, I'm launching the business, zero, yeah. dollar, zero revenue coming into 10 million for yeah. the business, or taking over a company from 100 million and taking it to a billion. Which one is harder and why? Um, interestingly, I think zero to 10 is exciting. It's hard, hard, right? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard, it's hard my friend, because as we talked about, you're trying to find essential product market fit. You know, and so I think it's just really hard. And you know, um, when you have a when you have momentum, everybody wants to work with you, right? Mm -hmm. So things unlock fast. Like creating momentum is really so freaking energy. hard. It takes so much energy. I, a venture capitalist who was on my board once described like, um, and and I think he said it. He said it the best. I'm not going to do it justice. He said, when you're in a startup. You have like your hand on this like gigantic wheel and you're trying to turn it once, <laughs> one big wheel to get momentum, oh right? My gosh. One revolution of the wheel takes so much energy, right? And these like, and then when you have like a bigger company and you have product market fit, it's like one revolution. First of all, you can get through one revolution very quickly and just like it creates so like, and you have many, many more turns, each of which are producing more energy. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like it's like trying to get that first revolution to create any momentum because if you can't even get the thing the wheel to turn once, I know. there's no momentum or energy Nothing. like net energy output. But once you have energy in a system, then turning the wheel is easier. And every time you turn the wheel, more energy spits out, right? So yeah, I think yeah, Jim, I think Jim Collins 
and good to great, I think, calls that like the flywheel. It's like just like keep the, the flywheel. flywheel going. Like you know, that's one of my favorite books. So really? one of your favorite books? I love that book. It's a classic. It's for, it's very like heady for me, but yeah, like <laughs> oh really? It's very heady for you. Well, I'll tell you the part of it. Just coming back to our previous conversation. It's a great book, though. But yeah, it's a great business yeah, book. Yeah, I understand that it's a little very analytical. Yes. analytical for you. But come back to there's a point he makes in that book. Another point which we didn't, which I should have thought up, but I didn't. We were chatting about the choice after the choice, and the yes. then what, and the then what, and the then what. You probably remember from the book his story about Jim Stockdale and the Vietnam War veteran uh -huh. who talked about like who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam and ended up being. Do you remember this story Tell from me. the book? Go ahead. Um, he basically like uh, Jim Stockdale. I think it's Stockdale was a uh, decorated Vietnam veteran, prisoner of war, who helped. Um, send Morse codes out and get his whole, you know, uh -huh. uh, cohort rescued when the war, you know, before the war ended. But he made the point that the people who were pure optimists were the first to get really um, depressed in camp because they thought they were being rescued tomorrow. Oh, and then the pure someone's pessimists, coming. Someone's coming, someone's coming right. every day. And then when they didn't come, they didn't know how to handle that failure. Eesh. Right, that, right. So they got very depressed. And then there were other people who were like, nobody's ever coming. And they were also depressed. But he said the people who did best in the, you know, in the POW camp were really like realistic optimists. They understood that it was unlikely that somebody was coming next day, but they had faith that somebody was coming. Right. And so your job was to survive every day until somebody came. Oh, my gosh. Like, so yeah. I love that mentality. I'm like, yes, you can be paranoid every day about what it takes to run your business and iterate and pivot and what have you while having faith that if you like go through this process and keep doing it, you, you will survive and you will thrive. Right, so that's what I mean about being bimodal. You have you can be paranoid every day and be like, I have to iterate and I have to pivot, while still being fundamentally an optimist over the long term. But it's that ability to pivot that actually makes you the optimist, right? It's nice. not like if you go into it being like everything's going to be perfect, everything's going to be perfect, or everything's going to be terrible. I'm like, no, no, you need to be a long term optimist <clears throat> and a short term like realist. Mm -hmm. What's a question you wish more people asked you they don't ask? I think most people ask me, Sukinder, what would you do? Let's say we're in a like Sukinder, what would you do? And I, most people should ask me, like, you know, what do you think I should do given who I am? Mm. Right? Everybody comes to a leader and they want the answer. And I think I would love more people to say to me, like, okay, it's not about what I would do. It's about, like, here's who I am. Here's my goal set. Here's my vision. What do you, you know, given this. Based on that, yeah. here's what yeah. is the What's best your solution. Insight? Yeah, yeah. Because I think, you know, like, it's not about me giving somebody an answer, right? It's about, like, I want to know, like, who are you? And what do you think the answer is? What's your thesis to which I can respond and try and give you some insight that fits with who you are and what you want and what you believe, where you have conviction? So mostly I think that people should ask me that question mm. instead of like, what would you do? Mm. Like, what's that about what I would do? It's about what would you do? When I, when I call you, I'll make sure to ask that question. <laughs> You'd be like, Sukinder, here's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. You know, here's what who do you I think? am. Yeah. Here's my unique gifts. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Here's my thesis. Yeah. What do you think I should do given that information? Yeah. I'd be like, oh, okay, well, this is what I would reflect to you. Right. And don't get me wrong, you know, the problem is if you ask me, like, what should I do? Like, I'm going to give you a straight up answer, and then you're going to think that that's what you should do. And, like, that's not, not always the right answer, right? Maybe it is, but it's... Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, yeah. but, like, you know, it's the wrong question. And then if you're taking action based on someone else, what someone else would choose to do, it might ruin the whole thing, or it might you got not it, go right? in the right this direction, is the thing. I think we, like, go through the world asking people who know us, like, what uh, would you do? And it might be, like, well, here's my reflections. That's interesting. What do you know about me? What do you think I should do given my own awareness? And wh like, what do you think? What am I missing about, you know, in this equation about who I am in this situation? And those people probably have a better reflection for you based on mm. who you are and your unique gifts yeah. right, and capabilities and capacity. But you have to show some self-awareness first. You gotta be self-aware. Um, excited about your book, Choose Possibility, Take Risks and Thrive Even When You Fail. And I think a lot of people, it's hard for people to like have this mindset of failing. But I've always been told that failure is just feedback as an athlete. Yes. It's yeah, just yeah. like, I failed every day in practice and games. It's like you never made 100% of your shots. You never yes, caught the ball 100% of the time. And it's like, okay, that's information. How do I use that to become better? Yeah. And not get down on myself, but to improve myself. And so failure has always been a part of my life because um, it teaches me something. Right. So take risks and thrive even when you fail. But I think that a lot of people are just afraid to take the risk because they don't want to fail. They don't yeah. want to have that, even a micro failure. It's like, well. Yeah, and I don't think they think if, uh, I mean, look, I think there, I think there's a couple things are going on. First of all, if you're an athlete or you're, let's say, in a startup or what have you, you're used to this idea that iterating, every iteration is feedback, right, in a feedback loop. You're also used to probabilities. You mm -hmm. know that 
in baseball, a 300 batting average is actually amazing, yes. right? Whereas in the NBA, it might be, I don't know, maybe the top shooters are 76% or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends like what the, you know, from the position, field or what yeah, have yeah. you position, right? Or you might know that if you're a trader or a hedge fund manager, the pro but you know that it's a game of probabilities. Yeah. So why do we tell ourselves it's, it's like one shot? Like, why do we think a winning season is like one shot and then we put all of the weight on that choice? I, you know, it's so, I think that is actually set, like the key for all of us. It's, it's that risk taking is a muscle. It can be developed. The book is more about the how than the what, but it's both. It's like, yes, this is the principle, but I think when people say like have a growth mindset, I think people need tactics. They mm. need a structure. They need tools. So hopefully the book gives you some of that. Um, but yeah, it's always amazing to me. I'm like, we don't think in probabilities of our own life, right? We think that every single choice is the one that makes or breaks us. Right. I fundamentally believe that the way, reason I'm on, like the way I'm going to express all my gifts or impact on the world is through business. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. And my father definitely saw that in me. He's like, yeah. that will be the way. Wow. And he was the most religious, spiritual person I knew, know, and also impactful and also the most entrepreneurial.